What's up, gangsters? How about some minutes of random? I am not even going to try and tell you that it's 10 or any specific amount, because <laughs> it's a lot. Let's get to it. Okay, let's get right into it. Uh, there's lots to cover. So the Hornet has been uh, marching right along, and uh, as you can see, lots of painting going on, and I'm not going to talk too much about any of that. I just did a couple of weeks ago a pretty exhaustive and exhausting uh, summary of everything about this kit, um, at least that I knew about at the time. Uh, there's one thing that I will talk about here that I, has come up um, since then, but what I really want to focus on right now is, uh, is the markings. So um, everything on here is, I mean, it, it's got the whole kitchen sink thrown at it at this point. It's got masked and painted markings, like those numbers right there and the insignia. It's got decals, like these on the uh, vertical stabilizers from Afterburner that look really good. It's got kit decals, like the slime lights. It's got decals that I printed myself right there, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, and it's got dry transfers. And I'm gonna start with talking about the dry transfers. This is something that's really old school. Anybody who was model making back in the day, like the 80s, uh, probably remembers dry transfer letters. You could get them from Letraset. They're pretty, uh, pretty common in the model railroading community. Um, and they were just big sheets of dry transfer letters that you could use for anything. And what they mean by dry transfer is that they come on a sheet like this and you take the the sheet that they're attached to and you lay it over the thing you want to put the transfer on and you rub it burnish it whatever you want to call it with a pencil or a similar device and it transfers nothing but the text over to the surface that you're on top of and that's obviously got some pretty compelling advantages because for one thing um, not only can you get you know whatever you want but there's no carrier film obviously so it's attractive for things like bare metal finishes now they've become a lot harder to find but I located a place up in Minnesota and it's just drytransfer.com and the dude up there Avery is really cool he does a lot of custom stuff for model railroaders and he was more than happy to print this for me. A six by eight sheet is $68, so a little bit expensive, especially if it's kind of an experiment like it was here. Um, and he normally charges more for multiple colors, but he was willing to do both black and gray for me on the same sheet for 68 bucks. So, did it work? Well, yes and no, all right? So, the very first thing that I did was I put this on the uh, on this landing gear door, and it took me a couple of tries to get the transfer method down, and I'll show you that here in a second. But the main thing that you can see, I mean, it looks pretty good. There's obviously no film. It looks really well integrated, but you can see that the text is not super, super crisp. I was a bit disappointed in the resolution. I mean, when you compare that to the similar size text on a decal sheet, the differences are, are obvious. Um, like you can see if I hold these two things next to each other, all right, you can see that there is, uh, well, if I could get my shit together here, you could see. Um, anyway, you can see that there are differences, okay? The text on the decal sheet is perfectly crisp, and this has a little bit of dithering on the edges. Now, I felt like it was okay for this piece. It's not in such a high visibility area, so I went ahead and left it alone, but... After some consideration, I decided that it was not going to be good enough for this very high visibility, high penalty area right next to the cockpit. So I'll get to how I solved that problem in a minute. Here's the other place where 
I've got dry transfers. Back here on the back where I've got the ship name, the Doris Miller, and you can just barely see the aircraft bureau number right there. So I felt like it was okay for that. Uh, you know, good enough. Not as good as I would have preferred, but good enough. So uh, how to solve the problem of getting really nice and crisp text here. Now obviously I could have just gone to printing decals right off the bat, but my initial thing that I wanted to do was just have the text. So I needed no carrier film. And a decal that large, no matter how good it is, with uh, a lot of clear carrier film comes with risks. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted to avoid that. And that's why I started down the whole dry transfer route to begin with. Plus, this also had potential application for my bare metal foil adventure. But let me just show you real quick why that also is not gonna work. So, all right, so this is how you apply these things. Okay, so get right down here and see if I can just do this real quick. It's really best to use uh, tape to hold the sheet in place while you're doing the, the, the rubbing um, because you really don't want it to shift. So I ended up using this thing as my burnisher and it worked really well. And you can kind of see as you're doing the burnishing that the sort of appearance changes. It gets kind of, kind of cloudier and that means that it's come loose from the, from the backing sheet and you're good to go. But I discovered the hard way that, you, you know, you should do way more than you think you need to do because you get one shot. And when you pull that backing sheet off, if it's not on there, you're screwed, okay? So that one went down, oops, really well. And that's all good. So now let's take a really close look at it, okay? Um, again, camera, camera work. Okay, so that's pretty good, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly usable for a lot of things. You can see, though, that with the smaller text, that that, that that sort of soft edge becomes a problem. And it's also, you know, it's not remarkably thin. It's certainly, I don't think it's as thin as like HGW wet transfers, but it's pretty good. At least if you're gonna put a clear coat over it, and you're gonna have to because Here's the downfall, all right? If I take this Q-tip, okay, and I just go right here. Yep, see, it just scrubs right off. I mean, it's not durable at all. So that's obviously a big issue if, if you can't put a clear coat over it. If you are going to put a clear coat over it and you can stomach the cost of it, it may have some advantages, all right? Now, does it have any major advantages over decals in most situations? Nah, not as it stands. So that was the point of the experiment, was to try and figure that out. So what's next? All right, well, I've been trying to find a way to print my own dry transfers for a long time. And um, I looked, I never had had any luck, uh, but I went back to it this past week and I looked again and I found this stuff, all right? This paper, okay? Now, this I got on Amazon. This was like 17 bucks for a set of five. And this picture right here kind of leads you to believe that you might be able to do something with text or whatever and have no remaining carrier film. Now, I knew that was probably too good to be true, but hey, you know, I like to test shit out and find out for myself. I'm gonna get this out of the way before I bump into it. Um, and, and so I was like, well, ah, whatever, I'll give it a try. So I bought some and it's kind of interesting stuff. So what you do is um, you print, you, 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 get, you get two different kinds of material, okay? You get the adhesive film, and then you get the other stuff. 
the actual uh, film and it looks like this and it has uh, a glossy and a, uh, a, a matte finish side okay so you if I get it out of the package ugh. all right so that's what it looks like you get a glossy side that's the glossy side and a matte side so what you have to do is either with laser jet or an ink jet you print on the glossy side now I ended up printing on this with my just cheapo Epson uh, printer that uh, you know it didn't do great but I didn't really care because I wasn't trying to test out the resolution I wanted to see how the transfer process worked and what I was left with and you can see that with the inkjet it was hard to do the next step without smudging the uh, the printing and the printing you know obviously not so great from a cheapo printer um, but what you do is you take the uh, you take this um, adhesive sheet okay and it's got two layers on it this is kind of a backing layer it's like a giant sticker and what you do is you is you position it and peel off this clear film that comes on the adhesive sheet all right and uh, hopefully this will make sense but let me just show you the instructions here okay so you do your, your printing and then you fold the edge of the, of the backing paper on the clear film. And you can just kind of see there where, you know, it's like they're showing you this is like a sticker. So you're peeling the backing paper off of the sticker, which is just the clear film. And then you're, you're aligning it with the sheet that you printed on and you're going to stick the clear film to it. And you use a ruler or something to burnish that on. And this is what you end up with, is you get this whole business stuck together. And you can see the uh, transfers there. And this is where I started to smudge it. If you, if you did this with a laser printer, it wouldn't smudge. Um, and you can see that I did a, 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 did a, a, a nose art kind of thing. I, I got the file format wrong and I ended up with the background. But it's pretty easy to get rid of that gray checkered background and you'd have basically that image. Now, to transfer it, what you do is you take um, and you cut it out. Okay, so we'll just grab some of this one and you're probably way ahead of me already. One thing you have to recognize is that because the way this works you really have to print any any text that you're going to do as a mirror because what happens here is and really I, you, I guess you'd have to do just about anything unless it was a perfectly symmetrical marking you'd have to print it mirrored alright now this is the kind of the tricky part because what you've got here is essentially a sticker and you have to peel the clear film off alright so you peel the clear film off and what you should be left with now is nothing but a layer of glue that is stuck to that backing paper, okay? And then here's where the mirroring thing comes in because now this is the sticky side. So now you flip it over and you put it on the surface you're gonna apply it to, okay? And now you gotta burnish that on there. And I ended up doing it a couple of different ways but the butt end of a, a knife handle is fine. Okay, and you gotta do the entire thing. I found out the hard way, if you don't do it, I'll show you what the result was here in a second, but you got to burnish the entire surface. Okay, 
hopefully this will work. Okay, so you do that, you burnish the entire surface. And then you have to remove this thing. And that should come right off, and there you go. You're left with the transfer. And immediately you're thinking, ooh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like an HDW wet transfer, only easier, except, yeah, you're still left with essentially this clear film that is nothing but the that layer of adhesive. But it's not sticky on this side. Totally smooth and slick. So, you know, that's not terrible, I guess, but you'll immediately notice that it does not go down into any of those rivets or panel lines. And I tried on this one with a little bit of solva set to see if that would do it, and it really did not. So that obviously is an issue there. Um, but here's what happens if you uh, don't do a good job of burnishing. Um, this is actually this is actually my first attempt, um, and I thought it was a total fail because the insignia and the film came up together, and I was like, well, that's a bummer. And then I, so I just kept peeling, and I realized that some of the insignia was going to stay on here. And then I was like, all right, well, wait a minute, maybe. And I tried it again, and I got it right. But but you still have the issue of that layer of of film. Um, and obviously you can't leave it like that, so you got to put a clear coat on it. Now, so that's the next thing I did was a little bit of experimentation with the clear coat. And so uh, the first thing I did was just uh, blow a really heavy layer of GX113 on it because that's what I'm going to normally do. That's what I would do over the top of decals, and so I thought, all right, well, I'll do that. And this is a pretty cool thing because this is an example of what uh, I've talked about with how something that's hot, like a lacquer, clear can affect the film of a decal differently than it affects the surrounding paint. This whole area was just MRP, or no, this is actually not MRP. This is the uh, that... Uh, uh, Dura, whatever it was. Anyway, that chrome stuff that I showed you guys on the last one of these that I did. Um, so it's, but it's a lacquer, uh, or maybe it's an enamel. I don't know. Anyway, um, it, when I really started to blow the uh, GX113 on there heavily, you can see what it did to the paint. I mean, it almost kind of like washed it off, but it did not affect the film. So you get that differential effect, and that's why I put as I will talk about again here in a second, an acrylic clear over the top of decals where I worry about that. And it would probably work fine here. But while that was a problem, <laughs> this, as you can see, is an even bigger problem because the next day, this is what it looked like. And I don't know if that's the film that's peeling up, or I think it is. Um, I thought maybe it was just the lacquer clear, but it's not. I can see a little bit of glue on there. Uh, let me get on that with some tweezers. And, you know, you can see, obviously, if it's going to do that, that's not going to work under any circumstances. Yeah, this is the sticky part, and it doesn't want to completely come off. Um... So, yeah, that's just, yeah. But that's kind of interesting right there that the film came off and it left the print. And again, that's been kind of a random effect that I don't know how to control, but if you could control it, that obviously would be fantastic because that's what you get with something like an HD, HGW wet transfer or <laughs> Edward decals if you're lucky. So anyway, I, you know, I don't know if this stuff has any real potential or not. Um, I don't know that I am going to experiment with it any further, um, but 
Um, somebody might. You know, it's it's interesting. But again, yeah, if you can't if you can't make it any more controllable than that, then you know, there's really not much use to it. One thing I also found out is that this film is not water. Like you can scrub it off of there with with water. Alcohol didn't do much. Lacquer thinner completely removed it with a quickness. Um, and here's a random thing. This is my seven-year-old Vallejo Surface Primer bottle that I've been using for pure hardware store lacquer thinner since I dumped all the Vallejo garbage out of it. And look, the tip of it finally blew out. <laughs> so, yes, that is definitely proof that the only thing durable about Vallejo Surface Primer is the bottle. Anyway, you can see that if I get to scrubbing on this, It'll, it'll remove that film. Well, I say it will. You can see it's starting to soften up. If I just dump some lacquer thinner on there, get it really wet, it'll definitely come off of there in a pretty big hurry. You can see it start to wrinkle up. So, yeah. Anyway, I feel like this was not a successful experiment but I you know I feel like it was worth doing because now I know um, and if anybody out there knows what the specific you know what the paper is that HGW uses I mean wouldn't that be cool to be able to get some of that and print your own shit on it and and do all of the things that we want to do that are not on any decal sheet in the universe or that HGW doesn't make, because they only make those transfers for, you know, really popular aircraft kits. And to be able to print those kind of transfers yourself, that I, I consider to be kind of a holy grail kind of thing. So, anyway, so you're like, well, shit, just, dude, print decals. Well, that's what I did. That's what I ended up doing is I went back to my old standby, got out a sheet of world paper decal, clear inkjet paper, and you know, people are I know are gonna reply in the comments with, dude, I got this other decal paper that works awesome. Yeah, every time somebody tells me that and I go buy it and I flip it over, it's got the world paper logo on the back of it, so whatever. It works fine, it's not great, but it works fine. You can see I printed these on my super expensive photo printer. And you don't have to have one, but for stuff like this, you really do need the high resolution. Uh, it doesn't have to be a $900 printer. As long as it'll print at like, you know, 1440 DPI, you can, you'll can you be okay with stuff like this. But the thing is, with this, with, the, with inkjet uh, decal paper, you have to put a clear coat on this because it's inkjet ink, and it'll smudge. Like I just put a little spit on my finger and you can see what that does to it. So that obviously is not gonna survive decal water. And so you can see where there, I maybe you can see, where I have sprayed these with clear gloss lacquer. That seems to me to, to work the best. Um, decal film is just clear lacquer anyway, as far as I know. So a little more clear gloss lacquer on top of that. And I just used GX100 and that worked okay for that. So that got me some decals printed and I applied them. Uh, I just basically decided that instead of having just clear text, that I was gonna treat this like um, either somebody, you know, was really uh, zealous and masked this area into a rectangle where, the, where they were gonna do the overspray. And so you got that gray rectangle, or it's like a vinyl sticker. Those are a thing in the Navy as well. Uh, but either way, I think it looks pretty cool. It looks organic. I had to adjust the tone a couple of times to get it where I wanted it, but I'm pretty happy with it. The one thing you have to know though about stuff like this, when you print on your print your own, 
If you do solid colors, they're going to be translucent, especially if it's like a gray halftone. Now that's okay because this is gray on gray, so it doesn't really matter. But like if this, if I'd been trying to do this with like a red or a blue, it just would not have worked. You have to go on to a white background that you have to mask and paint first. So at any rate, you can see that the, the sheen of the decal is still a little bit glossy. I hosed a bunch of GX113 on it and it still hasn't fully unglossed it, but it'll get there by the time I'm done. The main thing is I just wanted to bury it in a thick layer of GX113 um, so that I know that it's never going to come off of there and it's integrated into the surface. Now, speaking of decals and integrating them into the surface, that brings me back to an issue with this kit that I had not discovered until a couple of days ago. Well, that's not fair. It was there all along. I just kind of ignored it, much to my chagrin. Um, you can see that there's this decal or this thing right here on the side next to the canopy where it's got this, uh, this handle right here. Now, Ming gives you some very poorly molded detail right there. Unfortunately, because the way that this entire top of the fuselage section is molded, they are pulling the tool basically up and down this way. And that's great for all of these panel lines and rivets, but because this is on the side of the fuselage, it represents an undercut if they make those grooves there and so they just really can't. I mean, it's kind of annoying because they could have done it with a lifter and you know, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal, but they didn't. And so the molded in detail there is not only very poor, but it's just the wrong shape. Like it does not look anything like the real handle. What that is, is it's a recessed handle that pops out right there. And it is the, actually the shape of that decal in uh, real life. So if I can get a little better light on that. Um, so, and they give you a decal, but the decal doesn't match the surface detail and it's mostly clear film. So I initially elected not to use it. That was a bad decision. Don't do what I did and think that you're going to get away with that, at least not without rescribing the detail that they give you, which again, if you do, is going to be the wrong shape. I didn't even do that, but I tried to work with what I had. I used some ink. I filled in the panel line sort of detail that was there, kind of painted the rest of it, and it didn't look terrible, but it just wasn't good enough for this high visibility area. And so I elected to fill it and sand it and repaint it. And again, because I'm doing the whole touch-up thing, it works, it's organic. And then I put the decal from the Ming decal sheet on there. Uh, it went on fine, super thin, but then I put some aqua gloss over it because again, I want that inert acrylic clear between the clear decal film and the lacquer that I'm gonna put on there afterwards, which I have now done and you can see that it's all embedded in there and uh, you can't see the edges and you can't see the film. And so that's good, that's the result I want. So that's that. Um, that that kind of covers all of the markings and things on the stupid bug and my experiments and all that. So anyway, let me put this aside and I will show you a couple of other things before I wrap this 1,000 minutes of random episode up. Um, I've been doing a bunch of 3D printing. I've been printing uh, parts to check all the fit uh, on my Steiger Tiger project, including tires. So these are pretty cool, but I'm not gonna really talk much about that because I'm also about to do another 3D printing video because yeah, I had some major 3D printer drama that I'll talk about in that episode if you're interested in that sort of thing. But I know that all of you will or should be interested in these two things that I got from my good buddy Chris Meddings at Inside the Armor and also my fellow cohort on the Sprue Cutters Union podcast. And that's these two wonderful books that I've been waiting for a long time to get. 
We had a little bit of a snafu with Royal Mail, uh, but I finally got both of these. This is the Perfect Pits book that uh, Chris produced with chapters by me and him and Tom and your own Veen. And it's pretty cool. It's a neat, neat little book. I'm not going to do a, like a whole review of it. You can go over to Chris Becker's YouTube channel because he does a page by page review. But uh, I think it's neat. It's a nicely sized little book. It's got sort of four different approaches that you can see. Your own does his segment of uh, improvement by painting. Tom, because he's the aftermarket master and he makes all kinds of cool shit. His chapter is all about doing it that way. Chris, of course, Mr. Scratch Builder, <laughs> he does that. And then mine in the back uh, focuses on, uh, yeah, and there's a picture on the back cover, uh, doing the cockpit on my P-40 Warhawk using uh, some uh, Fusion 360 and 3D printing uh, techniques. And I just, you know, my, my segment's not really so much a, a, an SBS as it is just kind of talking about the strategy and the philosophy that I use uh, to approach something like this. Um, and, you know, not getting too heavy on like the technology aspect of it, but, you know, just kind of kind of give you an overview of how I do something like this. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you can you can get this from Inside the Armor Publications. Now, the next thing from Chris is this wonderful book that he has just put together. And he did this in record time, like it was like two weeks. And this is the Models for Ukraine book uh, from which all proceeds go to uh, humanitarian relief efforts in Ukraine. And so the bad news is you can't get one of these anymore directly from inside the armor. You can still get it from several retailers. I think if you go and ask Chris on Facebook or you go to the ITA webpage, you'll see who those resellers are. Um, I know like Tom Annie's is a reseller from his store. You can get it and uh, it's really definitely worth buying because even though, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a huge thick book, it is very dense. It's got a whole bunch of chapters um, and these are all models that are built uh, from kits produced in the Ukraine. And you can see a whole range of well-known names, guys who do really good stuff. Um, and there's just a lot of really cool content in here. Um, I contributed my um, Cat D7 Bulldozer. Um, and there's just a lot of a lot of other good stuff. Really, really cool book, and it definitely goes to a good cause. So um, try and get yourself one from one of the retailers that sells it. Um, if you don't, yeah, well, too bad. But the good news is there's going to be a volume two. Chris has already started on a, a second project where he's going to do um, another one of these. And it's going to be a little bit different. He's actually commissioning uh, some model some model makers to do projects for it, so it won't come out as quick. But it will be, uh, I'm sure, just as cool, if not more cool, than this one. So there you go. That's a whole bunch of minutes of random and a whole bunch of neat stuff. Okay, whatever. Here's a last little aside for you. This is a super cool pin that Chris sent me for participating in the Ukraine book, but here's the other thing I wanted to show you. So I just scrubbed all of that shit off of this mule with lacquer thinner. Did not touch the, the uh, decal film, the world paper decal film, but I wanted to get it off of there, so what did I use? Masking tape. Took a couple of tries to get it to lift, but if you ever have a decal you need to get off, tape should be your first First tactic, the first thing you try, because oftentimes you can yank a decal right off um, with, a, with a piece of masking tape. <laughs> I know that. I learned that the hard way because I've done it accidentally uh, more times than I can count. I actually did that on one of the uh, decals on the stupid bug, so apparently I never learned the lesson.